and only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Dursu Davis, I'm the executive director of the Ohio chapter of APA and chair of the New Urbanism Division, and I'm your webcast moderator. Today is Friday, October 14th, and we will hear the presentation, Making Decisions, Making Sense, Technology for Better Economic Development. For technical help during today's webcast, you can type your questions in the chat box found in the webcast toolbar to the right of your screen, or you can call the 1-800 number that's up on your screen. For your content questions related to the presentation, you can type those in the questions box uh, located in your webinar toolbar. And we will answer those at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. On your screen is a list of the sponsoring chapters and divisions for 2016. Thanks to all our participating sponsors for making these webcasts possible and free to members. Today in particular, our webcast is sponsored by the Economic Development Division of APA. To learn more about this division, you can visit planning.org slash divisions slash economic. On your screen now is a list of our upcoming webcasts. To register for these webcasts, you can visit our webcast webpage at ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. And to log your CM credits for attending today's webcast, just head over to planning.org and log into your My APA account. And then under your CM log, you can search for uh, the CM activities. And uh, in particular, you can either type today's uh, event number or the title of today's webcast, both of which um, can be found at ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. Um, this webcast, just so you all know, it is still pending for CM approval. We're hoping to get that through uh, by early next week. And I will email all of you when uh, it goes through, and you can go in and uh, record those CM credits. Like us on Facebook, Planning Webcast Series to receive up-to-date information on our upcoming sessions, and I'll also post when those CM credits are available on our Facebook page. And we are recording today's webcast, and it will be available on our YouTube channel. Just search Planning Webcast on YouTube, uh, and a PDF of the presentation uh, will be available on our webcast webpage at the end of today's session. So with that, I am going to turn it over to today's speaker, Della Rucker, to uh, get us started. Della, it's all you. All right. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, it's exciting and kind of cool to be able to, to be here, and particularly to be able to uh, get introduced by you. So uh, thanks again to everybody who's joining us this afternoon. Um, as Chris said, my name is Della Rucker. I am a, uh, a planner of about 20 odd years. Um, I have worked historically at the intersection of urban planning and economic development and technology. So I have done things as varied as economic development components of master plans, master plans for cities whose most ur urgent issues revolved around economics. I've done um, technology-oriented work focused on startups. I've done technology work related to public engagement. And the second set of letters behind my name, the uh, C ECD, if that's not familiar to you, that is the Certified Economic Developer Certification. Um, and that is the one of the industry standard certifications that is used by the economic development community that is given by the IEDC in a process that's roughly similar to the, a, to the APA's uh, AICP process. Um, I am the principal of a firm called the Wise Economy Workshop, which does planning, speaking, writing, and publishing around issues relating to 
uh, fixing economies and finding new economic opportunities for communities. I'm also the co-founder of a firm called Econogy that is an umbrella for a variety of functions that all have to do with addressing persistent social and community and economic needs by leveraging the resources of other sectors, such as the environmental sector, the um, educational sector, undertapped, uh, undertapped communities, and undertapped segments of the population. So with that context in place, let's talk about economic development and technology. So if you're familiar with economic development, and unfortunately I can't tell, obviously, uh, who here has what level of experience with economic development, I apologize. I'm actually speaking to you from over the Rhine in Cincinnati, and uh, we're in a pretty busy urban neighborhood, and uh, sounds like things are particularly busy today with the, uh, the ambulances going by. So when we talk about economic development, like planning, the, the term tends to mean different things to different people. And for the economic development profession, as for the planning profession, we're in a, a, a period of very intensive change. And that change is reflected in what we'll see in this survey of technology resources that are available. So historically, mainline economic development, in a lot of people's definition, was about big game hunting. It was about going and attracting the new big factory, the auto plant, the electric power company. It was about, it was about doing, attracting something very large that would have a lot of employment and a lot of investment. Um, historically, in some places, those were easier to come by than others. At this point in time in the economic development profession, those big game are fewer and far between. And when you see economic development recruitment, you're much more likely to see um, recruitment of companies that may have 50 or 100 employees, and that being seen as a victory. Whereas 20 or 30 years ago, that would have not received much attention. A, a new and emerging element of economic development, though, is this concept of tending the crops, is this concept of economic development's role as being about growing the local economy in a place sort of from the ground up, growing it from the assets and the resources and the businesses that are already existing in that community. So that's a transition that's going on at this point in time. Similarly, we have a situation, it, it's often you know, as human beings, we're often attracted to the thing that is outside of where we are locally. We're, we're intrigued by the new and the shiny and the exotic that seems to be coming from somewhere else. But we have, and, and that has often showed in economic development priorities in the past, but we also have a situation now where increasingly communities are saying, you know, what we really need to concentrate on is, again, growing what we have at hand, maximizing the potential of the community that we have right here. And that may involve things like stemming leakages. So there was a presentation at the last um, International Economic Development Council conference on managing leakages. So strengthening the economy of a local area by not allowing so much of its uh, resources to be spent elsewhere. We have a, a transition in process along the same lines where people are thinking about smaller businesses and the value that they contribute as part of a larger ecosystem. And we have an overriding, and this has been a very, very strong trend in economic development in the last 10 years, of understanding the need for workforce development and the crucial role of talent and talent pipelines people who can do the kind of work that is needed to be done, whether we're talking technology or we're talking advanced manufacturing or we're talking a very wide variety of, of areas of work. The question about how do we grow, maintain, foster, keep talent within our economic community becomes much, much, much more important. So. 
for planners, a lot of this reflects kind of a, a, a growing together of economic development understanding and planning understanding of the world. And that is, is something that I think we will continue to see happening in the next several decades. But when you look at the technology that we're going to look at today, I want you to look at it within this context of this framing. And one of the core questions that I think you should think about is you'll see some tasks or some elements that have a lot of technology resources available to them today, and you'll see some where there's a great deal of opportunity, where things haven't been developed yet that we need. So what are the things that economic developers do with technological resources? What kinds of technology do economic developers need in order to accomplish their responsibilities? Well, one that is a very common responsibility, and this often comes from that big game hunting model, but is increasingly the, important to, to building local economy as well, is to market their community. Now, the nature of marketing for communities, similar to the nature of marketing for, for consumer goods or for any other kind of marketing, has changed incredibly substantially with the increase of, of, of economic, um, let's, it, with, with the increase of economic and personal and exhaustive amounts of data available. So just like we don't take a claim from an advertisement necessarily at face value anymore in our personal lives, and we go ahead, go instead and Google whether that statement was actually correct, or we do that with political figures where we have fact checkers, and it's very easy when somebody makes a statement to go and check it. We have the same thing in marketing, and particularly in marketing of communities. So whereas in the past it was sometimes okay for an economic development agency to simply put out advertisements and make claims about their community, the proliferation of data now makes it crucial that they have to say it, give the correct information. Moreover, when businesses or site selectors are looking for a location, they are pursuing it, pursuing that search in a much more intensive, much more data-driven manner than they would have in, say, 20 years ago when um, the data wasn't available and people were making decisions more sort of on the basis of their gut sense and their experience. What this means is that when a business or a site selector, which is a person who's basically a consultant working for businesses to help them identify locations where they can expand or get started or launch a new operation or anything like that, that process of sifting and sorting and identifying where, where the company should consider investing that happens online long before they call anybody at the city economic development or community development department. In the majority of cases, communities are eliminated from that consideration long before anybody knows that they're actually looking at that, at that community. And that's a very different environment. And that's been a very difficult thing for some folks to get their heads around in the field. The, the, that, those two points together point to the need for a community to really put its best information forward and to do that in a very accessible manner. And that accessible manner, as we'll see in the examples, is particularly in a visual manner. So you'll see hardcore data similar to what we as planners are used to working with on, in our internal life but you're also going to see a very high level of visualization used in this. And that visualization and a, a sense of, if I can't find the, inf the information fast, I'm just not going to consider your community, which is very common now among uh, site selectors and companies that are doing their own site analysis. 
there is so much information available. There is so much. There are so many resources available that the tolerance for I can't find this information, and so I'm going to have to call that community and and ask if I can get utility rates or something like that, or I have to wade through pages and pages of a PDF in order to find the data that I need. Those kinds of relatively minor frictions to the person who is looking to, to buy into your community very easily push them away now and push them away far more quickly and often before the community or the community um, staff has any idea that they have been removed from consideration. Another, so that is one thing that economic developers need to use technology for, is to do intelligent, data-driven marketing of their community. A second thing is to do research. So often, and ideally, economic developers should not be strictly reactive, but there has to be a proactive element into the work that they're doing. So there needs to be a very significant level of strategic planning around what is the best fit for our community and our goals and objectives? And again, for planners, this is familiar territory. For economic developers, this is, this is a relatively new development. There's always been an, a strategic planning element, and often economic development and planners work together on, on setting plans and objectives. But with the increasing demands, that, that research element and that targeting element and that strategic planning element has become more important than ever. So questions like, who should we be marketing our community to? What are the niches? What are the industry niches, the business type niches? What are the size of businesses that we are well suited for, not so well suited for, are important to our growth objectives, et cetera. Who should we be marketing our, our community to? That's a research question. Should we be pursuing a particular project or should we approve a particular project? Questions relating to how a specific proposal may or may not fit in with and reinforce the overall goals of a community. Economic developers have, have often been accused in the past of approving things or pr proposing developments that maybe didn't fit very well with the community or created unintended side effects. And I would by no means say that that's no longer an issue. It's, that certainly still happens. But the profession as a whole is, I think, more sensitive to that issue than they would have been 15 years ago. And of course, we have the question of incentives. And we could do a whole separate webinar on incentives if uh, you truly wanted a reason to pull your hair out. But questions relating to incentives very often come down to what are we getting in exchange for whatever incentive we are offering. And that's been something that's been more and more intensely a focus of news and media attention, whether we're talking the New York Times study of incentives that was published um, about two years ago now, or whether we're talking about local um, public publications and local blogs. The scrutiny on those is much higher than it used to be, and I think that's a good thing, but it does mean that we have to do a higher level of research in order to know that we're doing, or to have reasonable confidence at least, that we're doing the right thing. Economic developers are particularly finding themselves anymore in a situation of really having to manage a very large amount of information. Lots of part potential participants, members, uh, members of their own communities, potential businesses. Um, one of the big pieces that has been part of this larger shift in the focus of economic development has been around business recruitment and retention. And business recruitment and retention is very heavily focused on understanding and keeping track of and knowing the issues relating to the businesses in your community. So instead of focusing on 
five large businesses that you're trying to recruit or expand, as was the case often, again, 20 years ago. Today, economic developers find that they're trying to manage relationships with perhaps hundreds of small businesses, and they need data and technology resources to help to do that. So we have to be able to answer questions like, okay, when's the last time we talked to so-and-so? Who do we need to be talking to right now? Do we know what's going on in the community? How do we communicate with them? And most importantly, how do we get them involved? Which is, again, not something that economic developers have always historically been good at doing, but is much more important now than it used to be. And finally, helping existing businesses do better. And so, as I indicated previously, there's a lot of them. And when I talk to economic developers nationwide and the ones that are realizing the amount of effort that they and their organizations need to be putting into existing businesses, that gets to be pretty overwhelming for them. There's a lot of these businesses and we're really dependent on them. And especially if we're dealing with small businesses, which is increasingly the case, in our communities, both because of the changes in how we're doing economic development and because of the way local economies have been developing, we have an increasing awareness of the fact that not everybody who goes into business exactly knows how to run their business. And so we often find ourselves in economic development in a situation of saying, how can we help them to do this better? especially given our own limitations of time and money and staff. So what do we have available today? The rest of this presentation for the next half an hour or so is going to show you kind of a survey of existing commercially available resources, online platforms, applications, um, data sets, etc., that are focused on answering or assisting with one of those four issues that we just identified. But before we go into those, I want to make sure that I give you a few caveats. One is that these are not exhaustive. There are other resources out there. And I often find when I go to a conference or I read a journal that there are new resources, there are new applications, there are new products that weren't there before and that sometimes products that looked like they were promising have sort of gone away or have stagnated or have been removed. That's kind of the nature of the beast when it comes to technology. In, in this kind of context, we're dealing largely with companies that are pretty small. So they don't tend to have, there, there are a few that have higher level backing, as in angel investors, um, occasionally even a small amount of venture capital investment. But for the most part, we're dealing with businesses that are small operations that are bootstrapped, that are funding themselves and maintaining themselves out of their own resources. And as a result of that, sometimes things don't quite look the way they appear. I haven't used all of these products personally. I've used several of them. I haven't used all of them personally. Some of them are very new. And so I don't want you to view any of the statements that I'm going to make as an endorsement. Part of the reason why I am reluctant to endorse anything at this point is because this is still a field that's kind of in flux. So products change. And costs of products change. If I pulled you this today and somebody pulls up that YouTube video in a year, those costs may be entirely different. They could be higher or they could be lower. That's very common in the technology space where, where pricing models will change over time. And finally, as I indicated, these companies are small. They change ownership. They change leadership. and. Um, Sometimes that has no impact, and sometimes that has a lot of impact. So the point of today is to give you an orientation to what is out there and to help you think a little bit about what might make sense for your own use. So we're going to start with the most common type of economic development technology resource, and that's 
platforms that are designed to help market a place. So these are the platforms that address the marketing issues that I described before. Getting the information out there about the community, obviously putting a very good face on that information, making that information very easy to get and very appealing. So these vary in complexity, they vary in how much information they include or don't include, and they vary in how much they take to set up and maintain. And as you'll see, there's similarities and differences between them. So we're going to start with the one that is, I would argue, the sort of industry standard. Um, this is a very well-developed product. It actually came from two, the, um, the founders were two gentlemen who actually are planners, and they were GIS specialists. They are GIS specialists. They are um, still very, very actively involved in this business. So Zoom Prospector is a GIS-based platform that takes a, a large, does, that does what GIS, what planners know that GIS does, which is to combine and aggregate and allow you to overlay a variety of different sets of, of data and draw conclusions out of those. However, Zoom Prospector does this in a way that's very accessible and very easy, particularly for non-GIS people to use. And as a marginal GIS user myself, I know I certainly appreciate how easy they can make this. So this is one of Zoom Prospector's um, active sites. So this is one of their clients. This is the uh, Saginaw region of Michigan. And so I'm going to show you this example. Zoom Prospector is very, very good about letting you, uh, about connecting you to examples of live products. And one of the things you'll see with some of the other tools is that they're not quite so easy to make that connection. This link you can actually get right off of Zoom Prospector's homepage, and they've always worked that way. So when I go through this site, you see a variety of information. And they start out with a nice little marketing pitch. But then we get into some pretty solid stuff. So it's always fun to try to navigate websites while on a webinar. And uh, so there's always a, a possibility here that we may hit a glitch as I start doing that with these websites. But uh, we're going to take a swing at it, and I think we'll be able to make it happen. So let me show you a couple of things on here. So when Zoom Prospector puts together the demographics, they're doing it in the, the, this is some of this is a data source that you're very familiar with. So the demographic data is all coming from Census and American Community Survey, and you'll see here that it allows you to see all of the usual kinds of data that we as planners are very used to seeing. It does it in a way that's very user accessible. It's very easy for a user to use this. Consumer expenses are done in are based on data from something like Business Analyst Online, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and again, we have you know, some, some broad data sets here. And we can narrow this down by specific geographies using the function up here. Um, labor force is coming from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And you know, we've, so, so it's not information that is shall we say, rocket science for urban planners, but it is a, a way to provide information that is very easy for businesses and site selectors to access. And that's really, really crucial to both meeting their information needs and doing it in a way that doesn't create a lot of friction for those folks to be able to do that. Another thing that this site will do is allow you to search for sites to search for specific properties. And I'll show you another site shortly that will do something similar. So I'm going to put in here a relatively small commercial type space. We'll call it a 10,000 to 30,000. I'll buy it or I'll lease it. I'm looking for an office, but it's pretty much any kind of office. Maybe it's industrial too. And then let's search and see what happens. So I've got a few opportunities here. So here is a building in Mount Pleasant. And I'm going to minimize that report there. 
we've got a variety of information. The, this information is about the property particularly. We've got, again, all of that data and talent pool and demographics and wages. We've got all of that information pulled in together specific to that location. So again, this is not a product that I think would look unfamiliar to most planners, but it's done in a way that is very easy for the communities and, and for the businesses and site selectors to use. So they've been very successful in doing that. A similar project that does not make it quite so easy to see their work in action, but does a few interesting things, is Atlas Insight, which is, again, a GIS-based system. This is a little bit different. This, pro, this, this tool is actually coming more from the marketing point of view. So I said Zoom Prospector is a product of GIS planning, which was founded by two urban planners. Atlas was founded by marketers, and so they're very focused on the sales component. So Atlas will generally do the same kinds of things. There's a property database, there's data reporting, there's map overlays, et cetera, et cetera. A couple of things that Atlas does that are a little different is, sorry to jump and down, I'm trying to find where it said that made that point. Um, they will actually track the searches to your property. So if you look right here where, whoops, I don't want to move that. If you look right here where my mouse is, they will actually track who is looking at your site. And the intent there is that you can then follow up with the individuals, even if they don't go and log on to your site the way that you would, uh, you might ask them to. You still know who's been looking and uh, you can go find that and you can follow up with them. Some people might find that a little nerve-wracking, but from a marketing standpoint, that's a pretty standard way of doing business. The second thing that Atlas does, I think, that is particularly interesting, and again, they don't really give you good access to, you can access a virtual tour, you can see examples of this if you log into and set up a, a quote-unquote free account with them, which of course is a way to market to you. They will set up a, um, a tour, as it were, of the site. So this is really, these are really videos, so you can see a, a screenshot from a couple of them down here, but these are videos that kind of walk somebody through the information on their community. So it's a way to sort of package that information the way you as the economic developer might want that to be presented. So that's Atlas. One that is a little diff done a little differently. Um, and this is interesting in some respects, is Statebook. Now, Statebook it does not, Statebook is much more focused on the data elements of this work, as you'll see from the, uh, the appearance of it. Statebook is very much focused on placing your community, not just marketing your community, but placing it within the national context. So, as you look down here, and I won't open these because, again, you've got to go through a bunch of login stuff, but you have the ability to do comparisons. Now, you could do comparisons on Zoom Prospector as well. Um, you can do comparisons here between communities. So, if you want to compare relative um, employment rates, educational attainment, utility rates, et cetera, you can do that through these kind of tools. Um, if you look at one of the specific sites, so this is comparable to that Great Lakes site that I showed you previously, and she's thinking about it. If this one doesn't load, okay. So here is the site for, for this one. Obviously, it's much more data focused. It's not a particularly compelling uh, marketing element, but, but this product was really designed for site selectors so that they could go through and compare apples to apples on a very consistent and pretty straightforward basis. So there's a variety of information that's provided up here, including things like taxation, which were not in the GIS planning or the Zoom Prospector tool. So this is 
This was uploaded specifically by this community. And we have tax rankings and tax rates within this particular county. This is a county in Kentucky. Um, we also have utility data, which again was not in uh, the Zoom Prospector to my knowledge. Uh, it may be for some communities and at certain very high levels. But uh, we can get fairly, and this is important particularly for industrial uses, is to get a handle on utility rates, cost per hour, um, and et cetera. So that is Site Selector. That, I'm sorry, that is Statebook. And the last one I believe in this category is, this is a relatively new tool. So of the group of these, we've gone from probably oldest to youngest. OpSites is pretty new. And it's actually pretty interesting, I think, how it's done. In certain situations, this is going to be a pretty effective tool. What OpSites does is similar to what we saw with the other, with the other tools, but it's very focused in on marketing a specific site. Again, they ask you to log in and do, you know, create free accounts in order to be able to do things. Again, we have a, we have a sort of a, a, a case for investing in the community, but then we have these sites. So for example, we'll click this one. So this is a specific, and we're not creating an account today. This is a specific site within San Leandro, and we have been, a, we are able here, sorry to jump ahead, we're able here to get to give a very detailed description of the location, far more information, far more site context information than we would have gotten from the other ones. Additionally, OpSites gives you the ability to identify the planning retirement, the planning requirements. And this being in California, the planning requirements are fairly fairly specific. So we've got a zoning designation, we've got um, for area ratio, we've got you know what's it designated as in the plan. We've got a risk reduction issue. Um, if there are specific incentives available, you can identify those here. You can also they can they can say this site is zoned for this use. You're not going to have a hard time getting this development done on this site. So I think that's a particularly interesting tool. It also gives a nice way to get in contact. It's a nice interface. It works very, very well, and it's really pretty easy to use. So that's OpSites. So we're going to look quickly at some research and analysis tools. And these are very different in terms of their complexity, in terms of their approach, in terms of what they include or what they focus on and what they don't include. They're also different in terms of how specific they are to your community and how much it takes to get them set up and to maintain them. So the first one is going to be pretty familiar to a lot of folks on the line here. This is Esri Business Analyst. So Esri, of course, is the maker of ArcGIS, which many, 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 many of us have run for a very long time. Esri Business Analyst is their uh, tool for doing market analysis and for preparing market information. So Esri Business Analyst, which is an online tool, it's a, it's a subscription-based tool, it allows you to log in and to identify, you can pull up the general census data as is shown here, you can do heat mapping of that census data, but you can also look very closely at data relating to purchasing. So purchasing patterns and data relating to um, what is called psychographics. Now, if you're not familiar with the term psychographics, that specifically has to do with not just what people purchase, how much money people spend on specific items, but on what kinds of preferences they do. And psychographics is the um, science, it's a, a statistical process for slicing and dicing a combination of census data, purchasing data through things like credit card and survey data, um, consumer surveys like the kind that you used to do in, in when you got stopped in a shopping mall and that they do online now. 
to identify very specific subsets of a community or of a, a population by not just their demographic characteristics, their housing characteristics, their transportation characteristics, but by what kinds of things they choose to spend their money on. If you're familiar with Claritas, that is another service that does psychographic analysis. Esri, I find, this, I find business analysts to be a better tool. It is sometimes the psychographics in Claritas to me seem to get a little sort of snarky. They can, they can sound a little disparaging. And Esri does a better job, in my opinion, of putting the information behind their psychographic choices out in a little more um, direct and objective manner. So this is the tool that I use personally when I do market analysis, when I do market impact studies, when I, when I do any of that kind of work. This is one of the first places I go is business analyst. A comparable tool that is very robust, sorry, I'll go back to the right spot. A comparable tool that is very robust and very, very, very powerful is focused particularly on the workforce side of the equation. So MC is Economic Modeling Specialists Incorporated. This is a relatively small firm that is based in Moscow, Iowa. Iowa, sorry, not Iowa, Idaho, Moscow, Idaho. Um, I've worked with MC on and off for years. Very, very good people to work with. The, the tools that they provide are predominantly focused on understanding labor market, on understanding workforce, on understanding what skills are available, what skills are lacking, what's, what chains of skills are needed to do certain kinds of work, and are those chains of skills available within a particular community. So if you're looking at all at workforce characteristics, these are the guys I would talk to. They are another one who has been changing their pricing model. Historically, access to their data was very, very expensive, but they have actually changed it recently so that there is a tool and an iteration of, of their work that is much easier to handle at the local level. Oops, hit the next button. Um, Data mine is focused, the next two are going to focus particularly on research for export. And that's a particularly unique area because that's a whole other set of data as compared to the things that we've looked at from Esri or from MC. So data mine is actually based on a technology that allows the company to collect and analyze the records that come off of shipping boats. So when container ships come into a dock, into a port, they have, to, they have a manifest, and the manifest identifies all of their resources, everything that's on the boat, all of, the, the, all of what's being shipped, it identifies who it came from, where it's going to, gives an address for its final destination. This is all part of the uh, shipping and customs process. Datamine has actually figured out how to, how to sort all of that out. So Datamine will actually allow you to identify who's manufacturing the, particular, the components of a particular product. Who can manufacture something similar to that or something identical to that? Who is ramping up? Because if they're ramping up, you're going to see an increase in shipments. Who is not ramping up? Who is declining? So there's a very extensive network here. They have been particularly focused lately on building relationships, as you can see here, with Cuba. Obviously, with Cuba opening to international markets recently, that became valuable. Um, the company also is based in Miami. And so they're very, very attuned to the Latin American market. Although, as you saw from that, they're also working pretty heavily with, with Chinese imports and exports. 
And the last one of that type is Velocity, which is a similar platform, and I cannot say that I know how they get their information. Oops. Velocity focuses particularly on understanding trade and innovation. So their, their search is focusing on investment, and their, fo their search is focusing on, on trade, patents, etc. So they are particularly valuable for somebody who is trying to figure out, for example, um, who's innovating in a particular space. And if you want to, if, if your economic goals are to be innovating, then that can be a very, very useful resource. I'm going to show you two more in the analytical space, and these are probably a little closer to home for most folks. And these, again, are two that I have not worked with personally, but that I find intriguing. And if anybody does end up working with them and wants to let me know what their experience was like, I'm going to be really, really eager to hear about that. In Form Analytics, it actually automates the process of doing economic and fiscal impact. So as you can see from their model here, they actually have an economic impact calculator. Now, about eight years ago, I actually was a project manager on the development of, an, of a fiscal impact calculator for the Cincinnati region. And I could tell you from that experience, this is, can be a darn hard thing to do. I don't know how deep this one gets yet. And unfortunately, you know, the, the um, ability to really get in and play with it has been, has been limited. Uh, but the ability to estimate fiscal impacts the ability to estimate economic impacts, um, the kinds of economic impacts that we see talked about, sometimes inflated, sometimes pretty accurate with regard to what are going to be the benefits or the costs of a particular development. This tool has some ability to do that. This was another in interesting piece right here, so I'll highlight this. So the reports can be designed to target either internal staff, board members, or clients, which of course are audiences that would need different information. So instead of having to do that manually, you've got that built into this system. And the last one in this space, again, I have not worked with yet myself, but I figured I should bring it to your attention, is LOCIAP, or LOCI, which is, and the site is LOCIAP.com. Um, LOCI is a fiscal impact analysis. So this is, the, this is a means of estimating what the fiscal impacts, the impacts on taxes and services are going to be resulting from a specific development. This came out of the Georgia Institute for Technology. Um, it is a, it's a relatively new tool. Um, I have not encountered anybody yet who has worked with it in the real world, but uh, it'll be pretty interesting to see that happen. So again, if, if anybody has the opportunity to work with this one, um, I'll be really looking forward to hearing about it. We're going to go very quickly through the last two sections because once we get out of that, we don't have a whole lot of options. So we talked before about the fact that economic developers have to manage all of this information, but information management or what's, what's often in business called customer relation management software really hasn't been developed for economic developers very well yet. It's usually a pretty bad fit. And it's very typically not designed for small staffs with lots of other responsibilities, which is your typical economic development team. So one of the most common ones um, is Salesforce. Salesforce is used by sales agencies all over the world, all over the country, very, very, very common. Um, it's actually, a lot of times it ends up being more of a managing the sales staff team and kind of forcing the sales staff, sales staff to make their management happy kind of tool than it is an actual um, effective use. Now, some people are using Salesforce in economic development, trying to use it to keep track of all of those service, all of those contexts that we talked about. It basically ends up functioning as a glorified database a lot of times. And that can be helpful in terms of at least just getting all the information together, but it doesn't actually enable or, to be honest, push 
folks to maintain those contacts. Another product that's similar, but again, is focused on the general market um, for business sales, private sector business sales of any type, is called Prospect Stream. And Prospect Stream is it kind of adds on to what Salesforce does. So in addition to having that full database that Salesforce heavily relies on, it's actually got a got methodology built into it for tracking, for um, reminding the staff to contact people. So it, it kind of pushes that that process a little more proactively so that people will so that the people who are responsible for the sales or maintaining the relationships are actually keeping up on it and staying staying in touch with the folks they need to be staying in touch with on a regular basis. This is a little bit of a uh, a niche product, but one of the few that I have seen developed for this environment so far, or at least a component of the economic development environment, is IncuTrack, which is a pretty new product coming out of Baltimore, Maryland, um, that's particularly focused on incubators and accelerators. So these are programs that are working with startups. They're trying to manage people into um, starting new businesses or succeeding in starting new businesses. And so IncuTrack, as you can see, and again, I have not played with this one specifically. I actually just found it at the IEDC conference a couple of weeks ago. Has the CRM. It also has forms for for businesses to fill out so that you can keep track of what they're doing. It has an ability. It has a dashboard that keeps track of what's going on within the organization, and it has the ability to estimate economic impacts coming out of the accelerator members. So I think that's a pretty intriguing one. I think it will be very, very interesting. And it, you know, they've got a fair number of places where they're working. I'm looking forward to learning more about this specific one. As I said, I just found out about it very recently. But I wanted to make sure it was brought to your attention. And so finally, the last one that I want to bring to your attention is one that I think is grossly underserved and really, really needs attention from the economic development technology planning community. So maybe somebody who's on the phone today is going to be the great grand wizard who um, figures out how to help us do this better. As I said before, we've got communities that have hundreds of, part of participants, hundreds of businesses, hundreds of people who are touching the economic development needs in one form or another. But very often, we can't, we as the economic development or community development staff can't handhold everybody specifically. And yet these businesses so often need guidance, they need information, they need direction, they need resources. And so we need to find a more efficient way to do that. One tool that is available, and this is commercially available, it's available for anybody, is a tool called SizeUp. SizeUp actually comes from the same folks that did Zoom Prospector. SizeUp is really pretty neat in that it allows you to study your business within its context. And so when you, you get a chance sometime, I'd, encur I'd really encourage you to play with this one. It's quite easy to use. But you can enter, you identify an industry, let me try one here. We'll try hair care. Let's see what we got. Hair and skin care products. I'm located in, I'm going to say Cincinnati. Cincinnati, Illinois. Cincinnati, Ohio. And I can do a variety of things here. I can compare my business to other competitors. I can find places to target for advertising. I can do a very a, a wide variety of things, and if I enter any of these, if I enter these indicators, and you can see that there are some that are at a little higher level. Let's say I put in, you know, a revenue number. It will actually estimate to me where my business is falling in relation to other similar businesses within my geography, and then I can also it'll heat map that annual revenue. 
and then it will also provide other considerations and some other information. So it's a very, very good tool. Um, a second tool that is not available to everybody, but I'm going to put out here as something that I think is worth looking at as a tool that, that I would like to see more communities do, is the Virtual Business Advisor, which was developed by Ann Arbor Spark. Now, Spark is the Regional Economic Development Agency for the Ann Arbor, Michigan area. And how this tool works is that depending on where you are in the process, you can get, walk yourself through an assessment of how you're doing. So we can walk through a process of understanding what's our business model look like? What are our resources. And walking through that process allows the user to get a very detailed sense of what information they still need, what organizations within the community can be of assistance to them, wide variety of information like that. Again, I would encourage you, if you're interested in the topic of helping existing businesses, this is a process item. This is not a matter of particularly fancy programming, but it is a, this process depends on being able to lay out very, very quick, very clearly the steps for starting a business, maintaining a business, evaluating a business, and then connecting the items to the resources that are available within the community. I think that many, many, many places could do something like this, and that it would be extremely helpful for small businesses, both entrepreneurs and existing businesses, because so often they don't, they don't know what resources they need, they just know that something's wrong. It's a much more efficient way than someone on your staff spending two hours with them trying to talk them through. So quickly to, to wrap up and then we'll go to questions. Um, lots of resources here. And as I've indicated, they vary across the map. So a couple of words on how we can choose the most effective tools and approaches for what we're dealing with. One is to get very, very clear on your objectives. For planners, this should be pretty self-evident. But very often, people make assumptions about what their objectives are going to be. Sorry, jumped ahead again. People get, make assumptions about what their objectives are going to be and who their audience is. and they start down a path that maybe was not the path that they should have been on. If your goal is to focus on existing businesses and to build out existing businesses, Statebook is probably not the tool for you. If the greatest challenge that you're facing as an organization is marketing internally, is stopping leakages, and you don't have much of an export function, then a data mine or a velocity may not be very helpful for you. Those are easy, obvious examples, but to make the point of what I'm, what I'm trying to indicate, you really need to be very, very clear on what it is that you're trying to achieve and what the audience that you're talking to is likely to value. There's lots of these online demos. Almost every site that I showed you will do an online demo for you. Uh, but it's particularly important to get a trial run. As you saw, Zoom Prospector would let you do a 30-day trial. You just set up the site, let it run for 30 days. Let's see how it goes. And the setup's relatively minimal. But it's really crucial, I think, to do a trial run and to have people try it out, not just people on your staff who are already GIS wizards, who are already data wonks, who already have that information, but people in the community people who are business owners, people who are small business owners, people who work with larger corporations. Have people try out the site and try it out with specific questions that they're trying to find answers to. Every one of these platforms has different pros and cons and people often buy a software as a service which is pretty much any cloud-based um, subscription tool they all have different terms and conditions. Some of them will let you back out at any time. Some of them require you to commit for a year or two years. And depending on how much you have to invest in that, that could be a big deal or it could be not a big deal. 
and every business, of course, has, as we, as we pointed out, particularly in talking with about, say, Atlas versus um, Zoom Prospector, businesses, every business approaches a problem a little differently, and that often has a lot to do with where they got started. And finally, learn about the business that's behind the tool. So how stable is the business? When you're dealing with any kind of online technology, chances are you're dealing with a small business. Are they bootstrapped? Are they indebted to an investor? How many people do they have? How much customer support can they do? If you're going to be dealing with a company where you're getting on the phone with the owner or the second in command every time you need help with something, that could be wonderful for you because that could be very high touch or it could be a problem for you because that person may not be available at the time period where you need them. How often do they update? Um, Esri updates its algorithms, which are the, the, um, the programming systems that generate those results religiously, obsessively, very, very, very frequently. They've got a whole team dedicated to that. Same with MC. You want to make certain that the, t the, the company you're working with is, is paying attention to making that stuff right. And then, of course, check other organizations. Not just the references they give you, obviously, but any other organization using that platform that you can find. So there's a little digging but that usually pays off. And so, um, we've got some time now for questions, and uh, I will be really glad to uh, hear what you guys have to say. I'm not going to claim to be an expert on everything here. I'll give you the best answer I can, and uh, if I don't know the answer, we'll have a way to follow up. Okay? Okay. Thank you, Della. So folks, go ahead and type those questions into your chat box if you have them. Um, just a couple housekeeping items that um, I'm seeing questions come through. Yes, the PowerPoint will be available um, in a PDF form on our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast, and that will be available um, shortly after the presentation. And we are recording the session. Um, and it's a, it'll be up on our YouTube channel a couple minutes after as well. Just search planning webcast uh, on YouTube and you'll see all of our webcasts. Okay. Um, the first question, will there be a list of the websites that are being mentioned? Do you have any of these somewhere? Um, or yeah. should we just have folks? Wh what would you like to do? Well, well, certainly, they, um, if, you, if you Google pretty much any of these, you will find, I mean, if you, if you pull up the presentation and you Google these, you will find the application typically pretty easily. Um, but we can certainly do a list of the, um, the URLs. Um, is there a way, Chris, that we can post that um, in conjunction with the PDF on the website or anything like that? Absolutely. Okay. That's very, very easy to do that. Perfect. Um, we have another question. If, if you could talk a little bit more about the cost of some of these programs and if there are different levels of costs and uh, that type of thing. Sure. Um, they, th most of these work as some kind of a subscription process. And they may range in cost from typically a, couple, a few hundred to a few thousand dollars over the course of a year. The reason why I balk at saying pricing um, is because in the time that I've been working with technology companies, there's a very strange thing that happens in the pricing models, and that is that the prices actually tend to go down over time. So, for example, one of the the products that I t that I talked about, I know several years ago was running roughly twenty thousand dollars per year for a subscription, for sort of a, a middle-of-the-road subscription. But as their systems build out, they tend to have sort of more of an existing base of resources to work from, and at the same time, new competitors come online and will often undercut them on price. 
And so there's this actual downward pressure on prices very frequently. The, the, the absolute best thing to do, and, a lot, and that's part of, also, I think also you'll see that a lot of these companies, if you go onto those websites, some of them will have pricing that is pretty lined out. A lot of them will say, call for a quote. And I know that feels onerous, unfortunately. You know, I've told tech companies for years that they need to just make the pricing easier. They, they're not always listening to me. Um, chances are to get a decent price quote, you're, you're going to need to talk to somebody, either online or through email or chat. But even information from five years ago or three years ago on pricing can end up being completely out the window with this, uh, in this field. Okay. Um, and going along with that, for smaller communities that might really not be able to afford uh, something like this, are you aware of two things? One, um, any free re resources? And two, I'm sure you're on board with this, but if you could just drive it home, um, mm -hmm. sharing resources between communities. Sure. Um, there are in if if you're not if you're in a very rural area um, this part well I'll take the second part first and you might have to remind me what the first part was Chris then I better write um, it down so I remember too <laughs> this is why we love her um, <laughs> so in a lot of particularly in metro regions um, if you're within an MSA a metropolitan statistical area chances are that there is an economic development agency for your region. It may be at the state level, it may be at a regional level, it may be a regional chamber or a regional nonprofit. Um, it, it could be any of the above. And very frequently, they will maintain some variant of the kind of tools that we talked about here, particularly the marketing tools. So if you go through the list of clients for Zoom Prospector or Atlas or Statebook, you'll see a lot of regional agencies. The downside to the regional agencies, and in fact that Bay Lakes, the, uh, the, the Saginaw, Michigan area example that I showed from Zoom Prospector is one of those. Um, multiple communities um, aggregated under that one site. The downside with that is that how good the data is in that, so the upside, let me start here, the upside to those sites is that they have higher visibility, they have more resources to throw at it, so they are better developed, they're, um, you know, they look better, they function better, they appear better than anything that you could, you know, sort of try to build yourself on a WordPress site or whatever. Um, the, the downside is, the downside is twofold. One is that a lot of times those agencies will depend on the locals to give them information about things like the site selection. So if you remember on the Zoom Prospector site, there was a um, you could there was information about specific sites. Well, if there's a specific, and I've seen this in many regional um, in many regional um, sites. If there's a specific location that's, say, in a small village or a township, unless somebody in that community knows about that site and uploads it to the larger database, it's not going to show up on the regional product. Chances are that the regional agency isn't going to know about that, you know, five-acre property that became available. I apologize, another ambulance. Um, they're not necessarily going to know about that, especially if it's a property that's relatively small by regional standards. Let's say it's a, you know, a two-acre site in the middle of your village. It's a big, important thing to you, but to the regional agency, it might not be so important. So, there's definitely a lot of collaboration that goes on in this space. Um, a lot of these sites are at the regional level, and I would definitely encourage any smaller community to make certain that they're, they're putting their best possible foot forward on those regional sites as well. But that takes some significant effort 
on the smaller communities part. The first piece of the question was about free resources. Was that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So, you know, fundamentally, if you go back and look at those Zoom Prospector sites, or the Zoom Prospector State Book um, Atlas site, those are fundamentally, you know, there's there's probably about 80% of it you could do on a WordPress platform or a Squarespace platform. You build a website, you say, here, we're wonderful for all these sorts of reasons. You pull in, you know, you, you take the census data, you put it in there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's, you know, a lot of, there are lots of communities that do that. And if you have a really good GIS person, they might even be able to figure out how to use, um, like, ArcGIS's online functionalities to be able to approximate what we saw on those sites. But that requires basically building it yourself from scratch, which is which might be a savings of money, but could take a lot of staff time and resources. Chances are the results probably there, there's probably things on those sites that you won't be able to do with your existing in-house resources. And the other thing that I didn't really talk about, um, particularly with regard to, to Zoom Prospector and the like, is that they also have an overarching um, marketing. So a site selector who likes the Atlas interface or the Statebook interface will go onto those sites and say, okay, I'm looking for this particular kind of thing, and there is a functionality for being able to search across sites. They're also really good at, you know, maximizing search search engine op optimization, things like that. So you you do kind of get what you pay for, uh, but it is theoretically possible. I mean, there's a very large number of communities who don't have any of these kind of tools, but they have a website that says we do economic development and we're wonderful for these reasons and you should come and spend our money here. Whether those do anybody any good or not, I think it's a whole other question. Okay, next question. Is there a tool to allow locality to analyze how its water rates, electrical rates, housing costs, tax rates, uh, compare to other communities to determine if they're an impediment to business growth compared to other communities? So in the state book tool, um, they do have a, you know, they do have tax data and utility rate data and et cetera. And I believe, if I remember correctly, that at the higher levels of membership in that tool, and again, that tool is largely marketed to site selectors, is you can do a comparison of that. Um, the two elements relating to that, number one is that utilities, utility costs only matter to certain kinds of businesses, and so a broad um, correlation between utility costs and overall business recruitment costs is extremely hard to do. You know, if you're talking specifically about a certain you know, tier three automotive electrical harness manufacturers, then you might be able to get, um, you might even be able to define the question of how important are utility rates for those folks. Um, you, might, you might be able to define that. But for overall business, you know, utility rates for, for many kinds of businesses are a very, very minor part of the, the decision-making process. The same with, ut with incentive, actually. So we get a lot of press. We see a lot in the press about companies getting incentives, not getting incentives, arguing over incentives, why didn't I get that incentive, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But there's pretty decent research from across the nation. And if you, um, a good place to start is the series that the New York, New York Times did on incentives at the very, it was December of 2013, January 2014, I believe. Um, but as an overall correlation between incentives and 
business growth, it's it's very, very hard to to make that case. So nobody has really done that analysis at a macro level or created a tool that would allow you to benchmark like that. And that's in part because, and if anybody knows about that, I'd, I'd be thrilled to, to know of one existing. I think that is to a great extent because what matters for one business matters not at all for another business. Interestingly, when it comes to the labor force information, so the, the talent pipeline, um, workforce preparedness information, there is a good deal of more analysis in that space where you can actually go through um, data from a company like MC, and they're not the only one, they're just, they're, they're one of the few that's truly commercial facing. You can, you can go through and do a pretty clear correlation between certain types of workforce skill sets and ability to recruit or lack of ability to recruit certain kinds of businesses. So that's really the only one where we've really seen a, a pretty solid and reliable piece. Does that make sense? Yes, ma'am. Does that at least make sense to Chris? Yeah, okay. <laughs> it'll make sense to me. <laughs> um, All right. This uh, next question, someone had signed in midway through. Um, have you seen any good examples of online zoning portals that help entrepreneurs get the zoning information they need to build or expand their business? And I, I think that person... Um, I don't know if you can help me with this, Chris, but it sounds like that person is looking for specifically, I want to do this in my community, you know, I want to start a business that does X, I'm looking at this property, I want to know what the zoning looks like. Is that, yeah, does let's that sound there. like? Yeah, and um, if they type in something else, I'll interject. Oh, sure. Um, so there certainly are, are some online um, some community, a lot of communities anymore have some kind of online tool to look up what the existing zoning on a property is, and then you probably have to go to the actual zoning code, and but first you have to get a law degree in order to be able to read the zoning code, or you know get your AICP in order to be able to read the law, the the zoning code to be able to figure out what the heck that thing that was on the online database even meant. Um, you know, obviously that's of some help, but, you know, not, I think, fully what, you know, this person's ideally looking for. I won't claim to be an expert on zoning or zoning portals. Um, that's, a lot of my work over the last few years really hasn't had a whole heck of a lot to do with the zoning. I know this is an issue that a lot of cities have been grappling with, um, and I think that there may be, and, and you know, perhaps Chris and I can do a little quick looking on this. Um, there, there are certainly communities that have done zoning portals. Um, whether there's anything that I would really point to as these guys are doing everything exactly right, this is awesome, I, I don't have one at mind. Yeah, I'm not... Um thinking of anything off the top of my head. Um, Tim, if you if there's anything else that you want to have Della talk about regarding this, um, just type it in. Um, someone else did, though, just type in uh, property.nola.gov is a good example of a site that provides a property snapshot, zoning, overlays, historic districts, with links to okay. applicable info. What did you say that one was? It was property.nola, N-O-L-A, dot gov. Oh, now everybody gets to see how badly I type. Do you, <laughs> am I still sharing my screen? Yes. Okay, so let's take a quick, quick peep, peek at this one. All right, so we've got a property viewer. And it looks like, I'm going to give myself some room to work with here. So it looks like I can search for a variety of properties. What kind of layers can I get? So I can get layers. I can see where zoning codes and um, historic districts and the like are located. Um, 
Yeah, so this looks to me pretty similar to um, some of the some of the better um, GIS interfaces that I've seen across the country. Um, actually, there's one in Cincinnati, Ohio, which ours is called CAGIS, C-A-G-I-S, I think it's dot org. Um, that's very similar to this. Let's see what happens. I'm going to make up a address. Main. No, nope, I don't have a Main Street. All right, I don't want to take too long to play with this, but let's see what happens. Eh, I can't. All right. So what this does is it'll if it if it works like the ones I've seen before, it will allow us to see how an existing property is zoned. What it will not do though is really walk you through the zoning, you know, what do I have to do to get rezoned? And I think that's a piece that I would really like to see. And I know a lot of communities are really grappling with how to take the not just what is this zone today, but the entire process and really put it online. Um, the op sites site that I identified um, earlier on actually gives a pretty decent ability to combine all of the information about the zoning, the process, the requirements, the um, incentives, et cetera, et cetera, um, the political support. That tool, I think, really does some pretty good stuff about that, but you're building it by hand for the particular sites that you want to market. Okay. Well, Della, it looks like you're off the hook five minutes early. How did I do that? I know. Um, <laughs> there, uh, there aren't any more questions. You must have answered everyone's questions. All right. So we'll just go ahead and uh, wrap up a few moments early today. Can I, um, can I throw in one more thing before you wrap up? Though? Oh, absolutely. Okay. And I should talk really slowly so that we actually hit the 1.5 so we all get CMs for this one. And No, okay. Um, <laughs> the, um, the one thing I would encourage, um, particularly when it comes to those questions like we've got you know the zoning process. How do we how do we make the zoning and redevelopment process more straightforward on, in an online context for people? How do we get better information out to small business owners? Those kind of questions. Um, I have not seen a whole lot of this occurring in the economic development space yet, but I think it's coming soon. Um, if people are familiar with the concept of um, civic hacking or if people are familiar with Code for America. Uh, Code for America actually has economic development as one of its priorities for the next couple of years. It's one of the, the focus areas where they particularly want to facilitate building out. And one of the things that they're particularly focused on is this question of, um, of, of making governmental processes involving economic development more transparent, easier to use, you know, less of a, basically reducing those, those frictions that we talked about before. Um, so if you're interested in doing something like that in your community, a couple, it might be, it might be interesting to start talking to some of the, if you have coders or um, startup, you know, you have a startup system within your, you know, like Startup Weekend or a program like that. Um, Give Back is another one um, that, that shows up in a lot of communities that's about connecting people with technological expertise to community needs. Um, additionally, Code for America does a fellowship, uh, which is a matching grant, and it's competitive, that where they will actually place a team of technology specialists and often there's an urban planner in there as well to work with your community to try to, to solve issues like this and the economic issues and the kind of zoning facilitation issues that we're talking about I know are a high priority for them right now. So if that's been on your radar as a community and sometimes they're big cities, sometimes they're very small places, you know, it kind of runs the gamut that might be worth looking into for you as well. So again, that's codeforamerica.org um, or, you know, look up uh, startup, 
civic hacking, civic tech in your communities. Okay. Um, okay. There's, well, now you're on off the hook. Uh, we have one more yeah. question that just came in. And since we have a little bit of time, we have four minutes left. Um, do you want to talk about the importance or lack of, depending on your opinion, of developing a strategic marketing plan for your community as a recursor to building technology outreach tools? Do it, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. One of the things, you know, a lot of times people in who did economic development in decades past, I, I think I said this at the beginning, you know, the thought was we're going to put an ad in some magazine and it's going to say how awesome we are and then the businesses are just going to come. And it's nowhere near that simple. If it ever was that simple, which I don't know that it was, it sure isn't anymore. Um, so yes, absolutely. When When communities are really looking to do anything involving making their marketing more proactive, intelligent, um, targeted, efficient, effective, it has to start with a strategic planning process. And that strategic planning process looks pretty much like what planners are used to doing, which is figuring out what we have to work with, figuring out who we want to be in the future, and figuring out what we have to do to get from where we are to where we want to go. And the ability to do that, and to do that in a manner that really lays out very specific um, strategies for doing that is essential. And that's part of why I said the first thing you have to know is what is it exactly that you are trying to achieve. A strategic planning process, and I'm preaching to the choir here, but that is how you, you know, regardless of what term you put on it, that's how you figure out what what you are trying to achieve. So yes, absolutely. Before anybody starts buying subscriptions or launching websites or doing anything like that, that strategic planning process absolutely should happen first. And it should happen well. Because sometimes it doesn't happen well and then, you know, garbage in, garbage out. So uh I'm 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 really glad somebody brought that up. Okay. All right, I think that's it. Um, the, to the Economic Development Division, thank you for sponsoring today's session, and to Della Rucker for joining us today um, and giving us some, some great information on uh, ED tools. So thanks to all of you for joining us, and uh, we will talk next time. Have a good weekend. Take care. <laughs>